You are all weirdos. Weird science is the revolution. Weird science is the revolution. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Weird Science Marvel Comics Podcast episode number 26. I believe that is legacy numbering, maybe 526. I'm here with my <laughs> men, Matt. What up, Matt? What up, Jim? What up? And we have a pretty big week in comics. <laughs> the funny thing is, before we start recording, we're just <laughs> we're just yelling at each other about things. And then we get on here, and it's like, you have to start all over again. Uh-huh. Uh, here we are. We have some big uh, things, including the Ultimate X-Men that everybody's been waiting for down at the rec center. We have another number one that me and you are going to talk about besides the Ultimate X-Men. I don't know about this book. This is what we're starting with. The Spectacular Spider Men. You you said to me, like, you're more of a, a single man type of guy. You said you would yeah. rather have had a Spectacular Spider Man. Yeah, book. Spectacular Spider Man proper. I want to I get that. And yeah. when, when you get into this, though, I'll, I'll tell you just right off the bat, my thoughts are, I mean, you both thought this too. It reminds me a lot of Joe Casey's, you know, nonstop Spider Man, where you just have a concept and you can't get past it. Like you have to do, and in this, it's just let. It, to me, the concept actually seems let's get Miles and Peter together and show how annoying they are. That's what it felt like to me. I'm sure some people will disagree, but I don't know. The concept is just seems didn't go past the idea of the Spider Men as being something maybe neat in the title. They're really annoying together. Oh my God, they shouldn't be around <laughs> together. I said no. I'm worried that some people might go with the idea that Greg Wiseman, who is the writer, and we'll get to the credits, is. The idea that he wants to prove that Peter is such a schmuck that just get rid of him. You know, that whole thing, Peter Parker's my Spider-Man or, you know, that whole thing going on online a lot when the games and stuff. But this Peter is insufferable. He is so annoying. He feels like he they've ramped up everything that would be annoying, but is kind of, you know, some of the charm. But when you ramp it up like that, you realize that it doesn't take much to get it to be annoying, to be flighty, to be really like distracted and quippy and not serious. But please, I understand what you're trying. It's way over the top. It's like Peter uh, ADHD over. Yeah, that's what. And, and again, people might. I was going to say it, but then some people have problems. I have ADHD. Yeah, I have extreme do. ADHD. <laughs> Matt has done enough with me that there are times that he'll tell you. Sometimes you're like, oh, these seemed okay. Other times, I don't. Tonight's one of those where I don't know what's going on now <laughs> suddenly. And uh, the, the idea of where we did something earlier to this, it seems like I have, uh, I don't know, some sort of spark going. Maybe it's the anger. But uh, yeah, he has ADHD. And he's just screaming. And he's yelling. And he's quipping. And he wants to do this. He's more concerned with getting a guy at a coffee shop to know his order than anything else in the issue. That is the thing, and it, it's, it becomes annoying. But you also get things like the term arachnobatics, which they like so much, they mention it like 17 times in the issue and also have it on the credits page. But this mm-hmm. is The Spectacular Spider-Man, number one, written by Greg Wiseman, pencils by Umberto Ramos, which I do like. I thought that the the art's pretty cool. Inks by Victor Alazaba, colors by Edgar Delgado, letters by VCs Joe Caramagna. <sighs> And you're going to jump to then and before and now, but it does, you don't really get the concept of, okay, was that before like earlier this day? Then all of a sudden the before seems to have lasted like 12 weeks. Then you end up because they're just swinging around. And I don't know where this lies in any sort of continuity. And I know that you can't have every book tie into another book and this and that, and whatever. But there is an easy setup because what this is, is Peter going to Miles and saying, we should hang out. We don't hang out enough. We're spider man And even poking fun at how many Spider characters are. Because at one point he's like, you know, we're the only two that know how this is. Miles is like, yeah, except for this one and this one and this one. He's like, okay. But the easy setup here is, hey, Miles, during that gang war crap, remember that? Mm-hmm. You kept saying that you were angry at me because I, I ghosted you. That when I was actually hurt that you thought, and you were hurt, but me being hurt and I didn't talk to you. I want to rectify that. Whether or not I think it's true, how about we hang a little? Because I realize that you do want to hang with me, and you do. But again, there are books like, I mean, just to throw it out, there's Spider Boy, where they were hanging out in that. Like, it's, it's just, I, I get this concept here of, like, 
don't know that we need this. And so it's just to get Spider-Man. But you are having just over-the-top talk. Of, and it gets, I mean, I it's a little Bendis-y at points with the Absolutely. idea. Right? So It's, it's like, a spirit of Bendis through that's for, what it is. for sure. Yeah, and maybe it's like even more of like a Ultimate Spider-Man Bendis-style deal book than anything else. Maybe we can go with that. But he's like, hey, you know, you know this isn't a team-up. Because, you know, Miles says, are we going to do Spider-Man stuff? No, no, no. This is just us hanging. And I'm like, right away, why are you in the costumes then? You yeah. can hang out as Peter at my Meet on the streets And they do somewhere. at one point. But yet they're swinging around. And so you have that. And I don't know. Peter just seems so off. And so he's like, I'm just plain old Peter Parker. Meets up with mild-mattered Miles Morales. Okay, that's fine. Oh, we have to keep going. I'm mild, mild-ish. So we're not solving crimes? No, no web-slinging. You mean that we're not going to be arachnobatic? I'm like, what is going on? You, you, all this is is getting me upset. And then even the idea where Peter says, you know, we're going to shoot the breeze, peek, peek in on others' lives. Think of it as a weekly reality check, a mental health prophylactic. That, that, who when, does, Is that classic Peter to you? No, does that sound he's like never said that word before. Everything in this, and again, Greg Wiseman, who did the cartoon, Spectacular Spider-Man, he's also done Young Justice. A lot of people really like him. What is what this issue is to me a hundred percent is a, every line like that is only to set up a punchline a, a panel later. Every little concept is just to set up a punchline, and it gets to the point at the end that you need something else. You're just it, it, it's like they're working out their stand up routine as you go down because you have you know mental health prophylactic. And then as they're swinging away, you don't see him. It's like prophylactic, he, he, he. And you think that that's Miles. It's actually Peter laughing at his own joke. But then is the jo- Yeah, Miles has to keep telling him to stop acting yeah, like a Miles child a few keeps, times. And I think that Greg Weissman thinks that's funny. The younger hero is telling the older one to act more like an adult. But this is just, and, and so this whole play at the beginning is just constantly like, okay, so we're going to touch base? Yes. And also, I want to learn some quips. I want I want to borrow quippage. And he's like, no, 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 you can't take my quips. Oh, but, but I'm the classic zingers. And I, also, it's like, okay, Miles, you want to hang out. I'm going to joke around with you. Don't every time I joke, call me out as being a kid. That's annoying, too. Yeah. Like, and, and you want me to talk to you like a, an adult to a kid every time? I mean. That's... And so, actually, you say that, and you, you actually nailed a, a something else that was bothering me, and I didn't really have a, a, you know, a finger on it. They're acting like they've never hung out or even knew each other. This is like the idea where, you know, then maybe you can play that up, but I think they know each other a little more than just, uh, oh, this guy started work last week. I think he's cool. I'm going to invite him over now. I realize he's annoying because I don't think by the end we're supposed to be led to believe that Miles will think Peter's so annoying he never wants to talk to him again. Mm-hmm. Now, if you did set it up, as I said, from Gang War, and he, Peter is overdoing it to try to get Miles to be like, yeah, dude, like you can go and have your space. And that's what he really wanted. Like he goes up that that's kind of a, a jerk move anyway. Well, but what well, also with continuity now, you really have to throw Spider Boy in here because he's a part of the dynamic now. Spider Man would be splitting his time with him. I, I don't think that I don't know that this is I think this is just the out of continuity type of thing, but it shouldn't be. With Miles and Peter, it should be something that means something. Hey, I've been and hanging out with Spider Boy a lot more. So, I've been neglecting yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, you could even you know. do that. I mean, he could come in as a guest. I know a lot of people would be triggered. It would make like, me tell that Matt to shut his mouth. That Spider Boy. We like Spider Boy, but he should be on the I, cover. Seriously, in this, get rid of Peter. Get rid of Miles. And I'd rather see Miles and Spider Boy. Peter is so annoying. And <laughs> then you go then the now, like again, like the idea that you start in the then. To only be, we should hang out, and then realize they're not really hanging out. They were doing something then, to then say we should hang out, quippage, to then go to the now, where they are actually fighting a, a crazed, hulking, hulked up jackal. And and they're going, and again, though, it ends up being, hey, this jackal, he's nastier than normal. Dude, focus. I mean, at a point, Miles, while they're fighting the jackal, has to tell Peter to focus. Yeah. You can't have that. No. And, and so because they in the now right away after that setup, there's Peter. And the best part 
It's just a weekly get together and totally hit like he's repeating things. But in the now, he's like, oh, my bad. Again, only setting up a punchline. It's and, and it's, then fighting it, the jackal. Right? Yeah, it's annoying too having to see Peter constantly apologize for things he's doing to Miles. It's yeah, yeah. I don't like it. So they're fighting jackal, <laughs> but he's a souped up jackal. He's a hooked up jackal, right? So you got that, and they they even say it. Yeah, he's never hooked out like this before. This is odd. Okay, we're getting there. What happens then? There are three times in this issue, and, at least and three. I'll tell everybody. Me and you have not seen the spectacular Spider Man. You know, cartoon. I got, but we looked up things. We don't know what's going on because we get, when we, when you hit meanwhile in this, in this book, just get prepared to not know anything of what's going on if, if you're me and Matt, because all of a sudden we go off and I don't know, it, are we on Endor? You know, too soon? <laughs> because in this, all of a sudden, Lando shows Lando up. Lando shows up. Yeah. They're there at court, me, and it doesn't seem to be involved. And yes, you may say, oh, that's a classic character, this, not ma- named. I don't, I don't know is. who. And if this is something like, okay, this is going to be a wraparound story that will eventually play out of our fight, you're doing it wrong. Nobody knows. And you went from fighting a Hulk out jackal to then go to a rando. Asking, being sworn in at a trial, but they say, do you swear to tell the truth? Nothing but the truth. So help me no, God. Again, I'm gonna lie. all this is is a joke from Greg Weiss. to <laughs> say, man, wouldn't it be funny if somebody said no? <laughs> oh, my I'm goodness. just going to lie Look, about everything. They say no. And like, no, what do you mean? I'm going to find you contempt. Well, actually, I'm telling it to you straight. Like, really, I swore I was going to pull out the Colt 45 and start doing all the commercials from Billy D. Williams. And he's like, listen, you know, jury. I end up telling the truth. I know I'm, the, I'm like, get out of town. And we're going to be seeing up, this guy in every issue for sure. And just then randomly. sits down and the judge says, uh, uh, and he says, flummoxed you, haven't I? Man, what a rush. And I'm trying to gather clues. And I hope I, I'm begging. There are no clues. Like, <laughs> I'm like flummoxed. Is that the catchphrase? You know, what I've read rush? every is Spider-Man issue there is. And this guy's not in any of them. I, I don't. But it might be in the cartoon. <laughs> I don't know. But but this book wasn't pushed. Yeah, Greg Wiseman's writing it. It never was from the screen to the pages. So I would know because if that was the case, we wouldn't be talking about it, I think, because we didn't watch it. So back to the fight. And we I'm like, why? Because the fight's going on throughout the entire issue, but you get interrupted constantly. And you get interrupted. With other stuff. So what ends up happening because of the fight lasting the whole time, it really doesn't matter. We're just waiting for the end. You know, I, I don't matter. think that they're no. going to be, you know, lose. And then you just tie it in because then we go back to then. And now it's Peter and Miles deciding this is where they're going to meet. No costumes. They're going to meet, uh, you know, on, on the ESU, ESU campus. campus for no reason. It only is that Peter seems like, oh, this place is cool. Like what? Peter, 50 years ago? He, he's, they're going to go in and hey, my, and then. A running joke becomes Miles deciding, oh, I'm not really going to go to college. Yeah, I'm going to go to college. Then for some reason, because one of his friends comes in, he's no, like, he's into it. yeah, like I thought that was going to be more of the play of a girl says, hey, you know, you should come here. Yeah, I'm coming. But we don't know who that friend well, is. Either. So they go in and there's a big guy who looks like Kong from the old God, Ultimate that guy Spider-Man. doesn't skip arm day, huh? I mean, geez. I mean, he's huge. His name's Kenny, <laughs> but it does look like Kong from the it Ultimate does look Spider-Man, like right? Yeah, yeah. And He's the guy, the barista, and Peter is real concerned that he be look, becomes looked at as a regular so that they know his order when he comes in. Such a nonsense order, like, too. And I'll point out, too, me and you have said, like, how many running jokes can you have in one thing? And really, well, there's also the one of, uh, I've been doing this a while. It seems like 60 years. And then Miles is like, I've been trying to graduate co- high school for seems like 10 years. It's, a, and again, there's those kind that, of dumb jokes. Isn't too. that the same as there's only two of us who know how it is? Well, actually, there's, yes. th- it's all meta jokes to try to yeah. make fun of Spider Man. I, I don't know why, but I, I don't mind if me and you or anybody else bitches about that. But when it's in the issue, you're like, come on, get a little more serious. But, so, and I was running jokes <laughs> that that walk, like, I mean, they're going so slow because yeah. they just keep coming. So you end up where at one point, Miles, I don't want to, and it's very dialogue I don't want to go in. I don't want to go, oh, there might be pretty girls. Well, I do have a girlfriend, but okay. I, it doesn't hurt to flirt. I'm going in. 
and they go and I lost track of exactly how they were there and every it's it's pretty bad but they you wouldn't know because the timelines don't make sense yeah it's really odd and he uh, peter's big thing and this is repeated over and over this is his lame order a medium first off medium <laughs> i mean th- this is the thing and, and i'm not uh, maybe i am joking but here if, if you don't want to drink that much coffee you go small if you're going to be a normal person, you go large. Medium is there for just nonsense. And usually what they say is that they, is he's trying to cut corners because the medium is kind of a ah, medium <laughs> iced. And I don't like iced coffee. Medium iced, half and half latte with a shot of espresso and a dash of cinnamon. <laughs> Ooh la la, Peter Parker. Like, that's the deal. And then Kenny, this big hulking guy, says, and your name? Pete. P-E-T-E. I will give Greg Wiseman one bit of credit, only one in this entire issue. They actually don't spell the name wrong on the cup. That's the, always the joke. Mm-hmm. I thought that he was going to spell it wrong. Well, he says it f- wrong five times. And though. then I still thought that he was going to. So then in the meantime, then, <laughs> Miles just uses his phone and already ordered online and picks up his thing. And then I like, there you go. Oh, look at the old guy and look at the young guy. But that never goes anywhere because Peter is so much and he's like, man, you can't become a regular. That That's the whole issue. If you think this issue is about the Jackal, if it's about Spider-Man and Spider-Man, Miles and Peter, you know, doing some things together, doing good. It's not. It's about Peter becoming a regular at this coffee shop that he just showed up at all these things and wants to force the issue. Well, that's that, that's I, and I think you agree with me on this one because we talked about it in the past, but. I basically, one of my main rules is I don't want to be a regular anywhere. Once they find out my order, I'm out. I'm never going back there again. You know why? It's the thing. And I'll, I usually only get the one thing. <laughs> this will show you how crazy again when we talk about it. So I go in, I'm getting the thing. The minute that I, and I usually get like at one point, legitimately, uh, I would get a coffee with extra cream and six lend. I mean, I know that's a lot. It's way I don't even use Splendid anymore. But at one point, I it was sweet as hell, and so I so I would go. And once they knew it, I, yep. I I was convinced. The only way they know it is because they're making fun of me when I leave. And and mm-hmm. that, I'll, you'll never convince me. There's of that anything jerk else. order in that stupid drink. When you go in and they're like, oh, right away, oh, here's Mr. Cinnamon when Peter yep. comes in, right? That's mm-hmm. how they they only would remember you because you're so ridiculous to them. Or they think you're annoying. And I'm usually not annoying. I just go and I, I pay. But it, the reason, it's just, I don't like it. But that's Peter. He wants to be able to walk in. But then what happens when you don't? That's the other thing. I never change my order. But in case I would, you never can. Because the minute you go in, they have it. You can't say, oh, I wanted something different Yeah, or today. I didn't really want to get this today. It's already ready. I don't want that pressure. No, I don't need. Yeah, what happened if you, <laughs> yeah. Like, that's the other thing. Because I would go. And this was just the local place that my son works at. I would go every day at 630 on the way to work. I mean, it was 630. So when I did get there, I would go up. And I remember the first time where I went and I'm like, oh, and they go, just pull ahead. I'm like, what? So I go ahead and they're like here. And I'm like, like you said, now, if I feel sick, I I still got to go get a coffee. Yeah. If you miss the day of work that day, you're you're they're making a coffee for nothing. And it's just then I start thinking weird stuff. Like really odd I stuff. I get so angry. It's over. I do anything I can to avoid that. Okay. Just to, I mean, just to, again, we're pushing this like they are, but this happened to me around 2018, right? I've never bought a coffee there at the drive through since. I've, yeah. ne- I've never actually bought a coffee. And, and you're right. My, to do my that. kid, my kid works there. I go and pick them up on the weekends. I could just go. And I think sometimes I'm like, I'm not going to. Nobody works there. That They never know. <laughs> I'm out. I, I'm telling you, I'm out. I'm not yeah. going in anymore. There's a slight chance that it might happen again. So. Yeah, because those sort of places always have like, so it'll be that one lady. Oh, my God, it's you. They have like, and I look and now all of a sudden it's like leaving, you know, not picking up your pull list at the comic shop. Somehow yes. I have to buy 10,000 coffees. It's, it, 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 and it's, I just bring it up because you're the only other person I've ever talked to. I've asked a lot of people. Everybody wants to be a regular. And you're the only one that's ever said <laughs> that's no. That's funny. That I, think <laughs> I, I think I brought it up on the podcast when it happened way back. Like I started screaming like, no way. Yeah, I hate it. And, or worse if they know my name because then I don't even know how the hell that happened. Like, mm-hmm. hey, Jim. I'm like, I'm out. 
see it. I just go <laughs> crash through. Uh, but in this there, Peter, it's the, you know, it, it basically plays out like cheers slash fr- like everybody there's a friend. It's like friends actually in their coffee shop because all of a sudden Peter sees Shaw Shan. Hey, which guy? And this is a character that was in the cartoon. I know of that and was dating Flash Thompson. And that gets uncomfortable, but I don't know why, because it's so long ago. And like, hey, you hang out with Flash now. I haven't seen him. All right, let's move on. And then Miles meets his friend who shows up. And I don't even know, like this kid shows up and he's like, hey, this is Cedric Harrison across the street. This Cedric's like, hey, homie, you at ESU? Yeah, I'm going to apply. I'm like, all right. Peter, yeah. the joke is I don't understand why, what not. And, and then you have this guy fake hit on the girl who's actually dating Kenny, Kong looking guy. And then we go back to the now of the, <laughs> and we're, 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 I'd rather talk about ordering at the <laughs> coffee know. shop because then <laughs> this buddy of his, Cedric, he sees this ad get paid. I thought it said something else at first. And it's like, okay. But even gonna... you see that it says spectacular, sensational, amazing, ultimate. All the different types of Spider Mans. Stop! I, I get. I, I, I this. People should know this. That this is an insult. This reminds me of Cody Ziegler. That's not a good thing. So you end up where? Okay, we're going to say. And they're, they're fighting. The while they're fighting the Jackal, even there's a lot of this thing. I don't like it. Greg Weisman's an older guy too. I think I looked. I think he's sixty. So I think a lot of this is him talking to the kids, but also. When you're quipping that much during a fight, that means you don't care about the fight. They are Mm -hmm. fighting a Hulk up jackal. And yet during the fight, they're talking about, hey, I'll call you Brooklyn. Uh, You can't call me that. I'll call you the street you grew on. Hey, the people will know that. And in the thing, the other joke is this is Miles Warren. And it's like, hey, this is Miles. And he's like, well, man, my identity. No, no, I'm not introducing you. And, And then he says it anyway. So it doesn't work, but nobody's taking anything for any sort of seriously. Maybe Miles is, but not really. But then you also go to a then because they ended up running into Professor Warren at the coffee shop because that's where everybody knows your name. And that's where he's like, oh, I thought it was this one. No, it's the other one. It's It's his brother, brother. his bad brother. We get this and that. and, And there's Peter just so, okay. And then Seymour Kreps comes in. Yeah, and that's where... (laughs) <laughs> the teacher says again this is where the, these plans oh no i'm just here to wait for my friend seymour kreps and the big joke peter says is i never want to see more kreps yeah and miles has to reprimand him again for being a child here's the deal you're gonna do this do it right you have i don't know why professor miles is going to be writing a paper on space and he's his next thing he's writing is about uranus and then Peter can go, oh, man, I don't want you writing about your anus or my, you know, there. You can have that. Yeah, that'd be but, good. You know, not I see more. Also, if you're going to do this, his last name has to be Butts. That's always the thing. Mm-hmm. See more Butts. That's all you know. Hey, I, I don't mind see more and Butts. Hey, mm. Miles says you're such a child. Hopefully Miles doesn't listen to the podcast. And- they, they go that they go back to fight. Now the jackal is like it's King Kong. And they're still making jokes. They're still making jokes. Well, you this saw. Thing. You also saw that Miles uh, Peter said his name. He thought he said his name Miles, and he webbed his face up. So that's an ongoing thing. And why is Miles shooting webs at Spider Man? It's crazy. What's going on here? And then <laughs> I don't know. And then then here's the other. Here's another joke. Hey, my high school teacher, great guy. His younger brother, Doctor Miles Warren, is the jackal and a jerk. And Miles goes, oh, so they're the Warren brothers, like Yakko, Wacko, and Dot. <laughs> the Animaniacs. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, I'm an adult. I don't watch cartoons, so I had no idea what they were talking <laughs> I about. I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> I had no idea. But again, I like the you're, Animaniacs. You're throwing but it was stuff dumb. in there that's ridiculous, and then you end up just as destructive, but far less amusing. And then you Then you go, meanwhile, and we go to a random opera scene. Yeah, this makes no freaking sense. Do you sense. know what this is? No. And I don't want to know anything about it. I didn't read any of the words, the singing. We had I just a guy who right was past. flummoxing people in the in, in in the courtroom. We didn't know what that. Then meanwhile, I told you, meanwhile comes Ron. Because now we go to what I thought might have ended up being 
Romeo and Juliet, but it doesn't seem. I don't get it. But putting music in a things never works. I've said this all along. Look at Speed Force over at DC right now. It's no, awful. you never put lyrics on a it thing. It never with works words. because no. then I start trying to sing it and it doesn't work anyway because you don't have a mel- the melody, the hook, as the blues traveler said, is where it's at. Not these <laughs> stupid words. So you're there and like, what is this? Then we go back to them fighting the jackal a little bit. They're talking some crap. Oh, my God. They're quipping. Hey, let's try to do this. And then we hit a meanwhile again. Now meanwhile, we're in Italy. We, <laughs> meanwhile means skip this page. Meanwhile means, means run. Like, <laughs> meanwhile means why didn't they edit it out? We go to Italy where we have an Anna run into Juliet and say, oh, my God, I've been wanting to find you. What, what did you? I don't even know these. I can't say, what, did you fly to Italy to do this? Because I don't know. And so, oh, man, I thought you were dating Ricky. Next thing I'm thinking, it's boys in the hood. Ricky got shot. He's dead. So he's out of the picture. She says, no, Ricky's gone. So now we could be lovers. They start making out. And then we go back to the jackal fight. And well, why is that? Happened? Why is that girl in Venice by herself taking boat rides? I don't know. And then the other girl comes out of nowhere, doesn't even know she's there, and they start making out. It is Venice, right? Yeah, Venezia. And, and you would assume that at this <laughs> point that these characters should be maybe from New York because of the Spider-Man book. And now I'm thinking that this girl should run faster, like. You chase me to Venice? <laughs> like, I don't know it, what's happening. It could be Vegas. They have that there, too. Yeah, I, I don't knows? know. I don't know. But if it was, I, I don't know. They have a fake Venice there. <sighs> no. This is just ridiculous. And then they're like, so now I can say it. <laughs> Juliet, I love you. Please tell me you feel the same. And they start kissing. Are you happy, Juliet? Happy. It's everything I've dreamed of. Now I'm starting... Uh, was there like some VR shit that people did and now we're like, this is the dream world? Are we now seeing some sort of black mercy over it? That I don't know. Yeah, maybe the meanwhiles are all tied together. How somehow. do these connect? I sat there and thought I, we they got a guy to. who ends up saying, hey, I'm, I'm not going to tell the truth. Then we get to random opera where the guy at the end, again, is this that could, he says, I'm living my dream. But then we get to this of dream. But what is is this like? Is it Dream Master, the guy who's never going to tell the truth? I don't know. But it's just confusing here, and, and it just joins things. This is like our longest review ever because it's so annoying. <laughs> so then we go, and if you like, uh, say like a Tom King, do I have some for you? We have a twelve panel grid that used oh, to mean man. something in comics, right? Remember when that was like a big thing, Watchmen and stuff. Yeah, now it just it just gives me anxiety now. Yeah, this is it. just a 12-panel grid of Peter trying to convince Kenny. Again, it's the then. This is where I said that it's like 12 weeks or something we're going to see. Like they t- He's now going and ordering all these coffees from Kenny so he can become a regular. On, and again, in our concept of things, it's right. Kenny at this point has to be so annoyed. With Peter, with this nonsense, that's why he remembers it, not because he likes him. Mm-hmm. And it just goes back and forth. Hey, Kenny, do you know my deal? Oh, I think it's like the one time he just messes up the cinnamon. And Peter's like, no, no, that's just cinnamon. Then they go back and he messes up. We're backsliding, Kenny. And then the, fun, the only funny thing is at one point he thinks that uh, Peter's name is Paul. I hope that Greg Wiseman did that for just the nonsense of Paul in The uh, Amazing Spider-Man. I don't know if he did because of how it is. And then we go back to more fighting of the jackal, more fighting of this. And then they finally get done fighting the jackal just to like web them up, which it seemed like they could have done this at the beginning. But because you end up having to have these, you know, this long thing going, because the, the main story in this legit is them just fighting the jackal panel after panel after panel and quipping. Even at this point, they, they kind of web them up. They get them in the air between some buildings, you know, something you could do with the Hulk, he says, but they start yelling arachnobatic. This is arachnobatic. And I'm like, of all the annoying things, why are you topping it off? This is a crap sandwich with with icing of just more crap. I mean, it really is. I mean, the art's cool, but four pages on webbing them up. I mean, I was happy because there wasn't any talking really going on and I could get through this fast, but four pages? A lot of thwips. Yeah, a lot of (laughs) thwips. A lot of thwips going on. I'm surprised they didn't make a, a joke about that. So, yeah, they tie him up to the point where, Jesus, crime, and he's going to freaking suffocate. 
Yeah. And then just, hey, we're so in sync. I thought they were going to make a joke about, you know, <laughs> Lance Bass or something. <laughs> I don't. I was expecting the worst. They're not in sync at they all. They say don't it work together, well together and say, "Yell jinx," and I'm like, "Come on, Peter, you are an adult." Like, stop again. That feels like Greg Wiseman saying, "I bet the kids say jinx still." Well, man, he's gonna owe him a coke. Oh, we can't say that because of Lee. Okay, we'll just say jinx. And he says, "You owe me a medium half ice." He says this water, this stupid drink, instead of a coke. So he was stupid drink. That drink, if, if I was that, that Kenny, I'd, I'd raise the price to that thing. He's so annoying. It'd be 20 bucks. Get him out of here. So then they just hang And then they, they find a dead skeleton in the end. Then they, yeah, because all of this <laughs> all went from when they randomly saw Professor Miles. He said, my brother is going to help me move some crap. So now they go off to the storage facility and, oh, let's see. Things are broken into things. And then they end up, oh, at least nobody was hurt. And, and is that Seymour Butts with him, possibly? Might yeah. be, right? No, Seymour Butts. Seymour Crips or whatever. Like, And then all of a sudden, Spidey sense from Miles, and he's like, oh, my God, somebody is hurt. All right. Are you, are, is this, are we going to find out that that's actually the, the Warren that we thought was the Jackal, and now we have to figure out who this Jackal I I don't know. It's just the skull that's, like, on it fire It seems like it's set up, possibly, with that whole... Spectacular, uh, you know that that ad that old Cedric is now going to call in, but that's another side thing. Like, it's bad. It's really yeah. bad. I, I mean, we were having fun talking about other things, so this went way too way too <laughs> long. Uh, but it was it was bad. And the art's good. The art is fun. That's enough to give me that fun flavor. I want to have things because here here's the final deal for me. If you there's a lot of things that you could do with Miles and Peter working together. You can work out some things, like I said, the stuff from Gang War. But there's other things that you can do, and and maybe what you have at the end, instead of quipping and things like that and learning arachnobatics, you can find out that Peter does have a couple things to maybe learn from the young guy and that Miles is happy to just hang out with Peter because they don't get to do it that much, and it's kind of cool. Uh, but no, it's it. My, Miles seems like he's ready to slice Peter's throat every step of the way. Peter is so annoying that I hope that happens. And then in the end, that doesn't make Miles look good either. Seeing Miles bitch and moan about Peter and have it's not fun. None of this is fun. No, it wasn't fun in the Miles book either when he was doing it. Yeah, it's trying so hard to be funny that it's not funny. It, it because it's forced. It's not. It's not clever. It's showing you know going meta at points. It's not clever. It's things that we all say and do. It's this isn't like putting a new focus on anything. It's just there for joke's sake, and then just focusing on being a regular. And then he yells. I mean, at that one point, he he's so he's more excited about getting that order from Kenny Wright than he ever was about the job. And even then, like, there's people dying in this book, and he's just, yeah. He said he spent 12 e- weeks getting yeah, that order right. That's what I said. When we went back to the then, you kind of thought that was like a, a day ago. But that was actually starting 12 weeks ago to get to this. And then at the very end, to be the deal you do see, that's when the jackal, fun, that's when he runs by. That's when they go out to get him. So this book actually started 12 weeks ago. When Peter had to force this Kenny to make him a regular. And I'm glad you caught that because I didn't catch that part. It throws everything off then. It, because it I, seemed like a, it was okay as a spur of the moment. Hey, we're here. Oh, I wish I was a regular. To then go to that, it doesn't even make sense. So what would you give this? I mean, I would have preferred to just have a linear story with none of this flashing around stuff. They're, they're fighting a the jackal, maybe saying some funnier things. But it's it's nothing like that. It's just it's disappointing. I, I'd give it a I'd just I'd give it a five. I'm giving a I like the art, so I'm just gonna go to straight five. Now I, yeah. I said Cody Ziggler. I might as well just say it, this feels like a lot. Like you want to have this book as possibly an alternative to Zeb Wells. It's worse. Like the joking and the forced jokes. These jokes do feel a lot like Zeb Wells jokes as well. That because he forces them in at the wrong times. This one is just is all the time. Like, there ain't no wrong time for Greg Wiseman to crack wise in this. He's crack Wiseman is what he is now is what I'm going to call it because it's nonsense. But, yeah, I'm going to go five and we'll, we'll move on to the next one. Well, that's the, the thing real quick is like with, with these uh these, these spectacular Spider-Man should just be a supplemental book to the amazing Spider-Man. 
maybe fighting lesser villains, not yeah, the big it's like the friendly neighborhood deal. Yes, it's, you, it's that fun thing. That's and, what I want. And it allows you to do stuff, which it, you could say it allows you to have Miles and Peter because they have the men, but it you're not taking advantage. You're here almost just showing that you want to tell jokes. Like you've had these jokes sitting around and you just need to tell them and it doesn't work for me. It's too much. It's too much. You have to have something going on and it have some heart. Even by the end when the person's dead, like nothing hits yeah. because you're like already so tired of just Peter being insufferable and Miles being pissed off that you're like, please, let's get out of here. Still not as bad as that J.J. Abrams and his son book. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. Like, this oh, is, it wasn't, from somebody, the brought that up. somebody brought that up the other day. Abrams. I'm like, ooh, son. that was, that was yeah. terrible. That, you knew that son just... Eh, he tried. If I want an alternative book right now, I'm reading Superior Spider-Man or Spider-Boy. Yeah, or, I mean, people would say Ultimate. I know people and will Ultimate, say Ultimate. So that goes without at saying. A point, and actually, for me and you, because we do like, a lot of people don't like Spider-Boy or Superior, but at a point right now where, you know, at, oh, man, I wish we had another Spider-Man book because I'm not liking Zeb Wells. There's a lot to go around. Like, I have enough now. I don't mm-hmm. need this, and this didn't do it. I just... I, I was looking forward to this. I actually really thought that I thought it was going to be a fun book. I thought it was going to be cool to have them. And I can't tell you. I'm down to a four. I, I like the art, though, but it's just it's it was infuriating. But yeah, we'll probably get yelled at for it. Probably because we talked about <laughs> it for too long. Hey, what's going on, all you marvelous Marvelites? Welcome to the Weird Science Marvel podcast. My name is Zach, and today I'll be reviewing What If Aliens number one. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with the what if stories from Marvel, it's basically just this hypothetical story. It's like, oh, what if this character did this thing in this certain project, right? So, like, you know, we've had like a what if Wolverine got the Venom symbiote, et cetera, et cetera. It's just one of those ideas like, oh, what if this happened? It's basically Elseworlds for Marvel. And this is the first ever time Marvel has done a what if scenario for aliens. It's the first time they've ever done an Elseworlds situation. So, what is it about? What if aliens? What if. Carter Burke had lived. That's right, Burke from Aliens. You know, Paul Reiser's character. Well, Paul Reiser, he wrote the concept for this. Uh, Paul Reiser and his son Leon Reiser came up with the concept along with help by Adam F. Goldberg, Hans Rodianoff, and Brian Volk Weiss. And part one is actually written by Hans Rodianoff and Adam F. Goldberg with artwork by I'm going to butcher this. Giu Villanova? Giu Villanova? With colors by Yin Nitro, and the letterer is VC's Clayton Coles. And yeah, so we start out the comic with literally just recreating the scene after uh, Ripley and Newt had gotten attacked by the facehuggers when Burke had locked them in, and Hudson's yelling about how they should off him and everything, and Hicks is like, oh, it, just, it doesn't make any sense, and Ripley explains the whole thing, where it's like, oh, he figured he could sneak an alien back through quarantine if one of us was impregnated, and we could just get frozen for the trip home, and Hicks is like, well, wait a minute, that wouldn't work, because we'd all know he impregnated y'all with that alien egg, and she's like, yeah, but he would sabotage y'all's pods and kill y'all, and so yeah, obviously they're about to kill him when the power goes out and the alien's here. This is all from the Aliens movie, so if you've seen the Aliens movie, you know where we're at. Well, Burke obviously uses the opportunity to weasel out of it. He runs away when he encounters the alien. And this is all accurate to the movie up to this point. And in the movie, that's the last we see of Burke. You know, we just see him coming face to face with an alien, and then we do not see his death at that. We just assume, oh, he died, right? Well, that's where the what if comes in. What if Burke had lived? So we then see what happens. He got taken to the hive, and he is cocooned on the wall. He is about to be face hugged by an egg. When all of a sudden, right above him, in the air ducts, is Vasquez and Gorman. Now, Vasquez and Gorman, you know, they're part of the Colonial Marines. This is the scene where they decide to kill themselves with the grenade. And because of that explosion, exploding the ducts, the explosion happens, it, the debris falls down, it crushes the alien egg, and the uh, debris also helps dislodge him from the cocooning, so he's able to get out. And so he then sneaks through the hive, and he gets up to where uh, the elevators are, and he sees Ripley coming down with the uh, the flamethrower and everything, and while she's off to go find Newt with the uh, heartbeat monitor, he goes up and he sneaks up to the dropship while uh, we see Bishop uh, taking care of Hicks, who's been badly burned. 
So uh, Burke gets on board. He hides in the uh, cargo hold of that uh, dropship, and they fly back up to Sulaco. And you know he's he's hiding on the ship while when he comes to like sneak out, he sees that Ripley is facing the alien queen, and it's pretty cool. She's in the power loader, and so they're fighting. He uses that opportunity to uh, sneak back into the cargo hold of the ship again, and you know he just hides away there for a few hours. And then eventually he comes right back out to see what has happened. And he sees that Ripley, Newt, and Hicks are all in the cryopods. They have frozen themselves for the trip back home, like the ending of the Aliens movie. So he then takes the opportunity to hail Mr. Utani. And Mr. Utani's be like, oh, Burke, we thought you were dead. Uh, what the heck? How did you let Hadley's hope explode? Uh, was the mission successful? Were you able to retrieve anything? And... Burke's like, no, no, they, they destroyed Hadley's Hope. They destroyed all the samples. I almost had it, but Ripley and the others, they, they were able to stop me. And Mr. Yutani's just like, oh, my, you're such a failure. Your incompetency. Oh, my goodness. You're coming back to us empty handed. How dare you? And uh, Burke is me like, well, hold on, hold on now. I I didn't do this and that, blah, blah, blah. The, the vaporizing of the colony, it just happened. There was nothing I could have done. And uh, Mr. Yutani's like, oh, we don't care. We do not care. And Mr. Yutani's like, oh, this does not look good for you, Burke. It does not look good at all. And Burke's like, uh, well, you know what else doesn't look good? Ripley's evidence against you. And uh, Yutani's going to be like, oh, she has no evidence of the uh, xenomorphs or whatnot. It's our word against hers. And Burke's like, well, she don't even need the xenomorphs. Your colony, the one that you built, your company built, your company is responsible for the death of 158 families. And uh, Mealy Utani is just like, uh, it's unlikely that their uh, families would even be able to afford lawsuits against us. And uh, Utani's like, well, you know what? There's no point arguing with you. Uh, good luck out there. And Burke's like, wait, wait a minute. You're, you're not going to send anybody to help me? And he's like, why? Utani's like, why, why would we do that? You know, you offer nothing to us. You have nothing to give us. Why should we bother to go out and help you? And Burke's like, please, I got a family. I got a wife and a baby. They need me. And Yutani's like, yawn. Oh, who cares? I care less. All we got to tell them is you died on that planet, too. But like, it's not a big deal. You're, you're, you're stuck out there. You'll die if we don't send help. What do you have to offer that will actually help us? And Burke's like, well, well, you can't. Well, here's the thing. You, you can't take the chance that somebody comes out here and finds us because if they come out and find us, then we're going to be a headache for you later. And Yutani's just like, oh, all right, fine. I'll make you a deal. You get rid of Ripley and the other two, and we will get somebody to rescue you. We will send a ship out to rescue you. You will be the only survivor, and you will agree not to say anything to anybody. And Burke's like, done, so long as you give me a lifetime contract with Waylon Yutani, a retirement package, and dental for my kid. And Yutani's like, fine, whatever. Just just make it look like an accident. Kill Ripley and the others. So, we then see what Burke does. So, Burke takes Ripley, Newt, and Hicks's, uh cryopods. He puts them in the emergency escape vehicle, you know, the EEV. And then, you know what he does? He sets a fire. Which causes the EEV to get ejected and to go and crash land on the Fury planet from Alien 3. That's right, everybody. For those of you wondering what happened to set the fire that caused the EV to go down onto the prison planet in Alien 3, Burke's the one who set the fire. Oh my goodness, I love this so much. I love this idea where it's like, oh hey, Burke sent them down there. You know, he's the because, you know, to me, I'm, I'm one of those people where I don't like Alien 3 much, personally. Because there's just so many things, there's so many leaps in logic, because like, first off, it's like, oh, well, somehow an alien egg got on board the EV. Somehow, two face huggers get on board, even though they're supposedly only one egg. And also, it's like, oh, some, somehow there was a fire. Somehow, a fire got set that sent the EV off the Sulaco down to the prison planet uh, Fior Fiorina Fury 161. And it was never really explained in the movie. I like this explanation a lot. Now, obviously, this is an Elseworld, so it doesn't actually fit into Alien canon. But I like that idea a lot, that Burke's the one who sent them to that prison planet. And I know you're wondering, why on earth would Burke send them down there rather than killing them? Well, it's because it's his insurance policy. He's like, I don't trust Wayland yutani to not try and screw me over later on. 
I know they're going to. So you know what? I know Ripley. Ripley is a fighter. She is a survivor. She will survive whatever gets thrown at her. And you know what? She's going to screw over Wayland Yutani in a big, bad way. She's the only one who could take them down. I'm sure of it. And so that's his insurance policy. He's like, he's like, I know this plan I'm sending to you has people down there. I don't know what it is. I just know there's a colony down there. He doesn't know it's a prison planet. But either way, he's just like, oh, there's a planet below me. It has people there. I'm sending you there. He accidentally screws over Ripley again. It's so freaking funny. I freaking love it. I, I love this idea so much. I love how it explains how the EEV gets down to the planet. I love how, you know, it explains fire. I just, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Unfortunately, that's where I start, stop loving it. Because <laughs> there is one big, very glaring problem with what happens there. Even though I love that scene where it's like Burke's responsible for the EEV crashing on the Fury prison planet. There's a big problem. The whole concept behind him doing this for Wei Tani is that he is returning to them empty-handed, so in order to gain their uh, help, he's gotta kill Ripley and them. He doesn't have an alien sample. What's on the EEV that crash lands on the Fury planet in Alien 3? Not one. Two face huggers, or at, at the very least, at least one face hugger and one impregnated Ripley. Either way, there are alien samples on the EEV, and somehow he did not notice them. I find that very hard to believe, especially, I don't know, especially because wasn't there supposed to be an alien egg on the EEV too? I, I can't remember if that was just a behind the scenes photo, maybe that, I don't remember that being in the movie. So, but either way, that is a huge problem. Where he's just like, oh, I have no alien sample, so you know what? I gotta do what you alien Tony says, and I gotta screw over Ripley. And it's just like, but Ripley has the genetic sample in the EEV with her. That, that's a huge problem. Now, you could hand wave this away and just be like, oh, well, this is an elsewhere. Maybe it didn't, wasn't in there. But I don't know. It seems to follow continuity so well until it just doesn't. So I don't know. I don't know. It's so odd. It almost feels like those people didn't, the people who wrote this comic did not watch Alien 3, or at the very least, they knew that, they knew some things about Alien 3, but not all, everything. I don't know. It's so bizarre. It's so weird. I don't know. I don't know. To me, that is a big, big red flag with this comic, but I still, I just love that Burke's behind the fire, but I don't love that he was so incompetent, he did not see the alien egg on the ship, or even the face hug, or whatever. And even then, why didn't the facehugger attack him while he was in the EV then? It's just, it's so odd. It's so, so odd. But like I said, I'm not going to blame this comic too terribly much because that is Alien 3 problems. Um, uh, I don't like Alien 3. I'm sorry. I just don't. But moving on. So Burke puts him into a uh, cryo sleep and he waits for Wayland Yutani to come and rescue him. So we then jump to 35 years later. And now we see old man Carter Burke, and he's just living a very mundane life as a uh, Wayland Yutani employee. And, you know, it's just very much, and he's talking about, like, oh, everything's stupid. Stupid shower, stupid donut, stupid mattress, you know. And he's just very bored with his life. You know, he's biking everywhere. And, you know, he's just talking to all these random people. And uh, it shows he's a Carter Burke mining operations and assets manager. That's what's on his door at work. And, yeah, so he's just, you know, living out his days, and then we come to realize that it's actually a simulation. He actually is on this mining colony planet in the farthest reaches of space where Weyland Yutani here's the thing, Weyland Yutani lied to him, and they used him as a scapegoat. They're like, oh hey, uh, we, uh, Carter Burke, you know, he was in charge of Hadley's Hope, and he's the one who due to negligent oversight of the construction of the plant, is responsible for there being a critical failure in the uh, uh, the terraforming outfit. I can't remember what it's exactly called. But either way, he is the responsible for the death of 158 families. They used him as a scapegoat. And, yeah. So they, they really screwed him over. So everybody in the universe now thinks, oh, Carter Burke, he's the a-hole who screwed over everybody on Hallie's Hope, you know, and they just completely sweep the Xenomorph thing under the rug, and the only reason why Carter Burke has not spoken out against them is because they're like, look, now we've made you public entity number one. You can't just live anywhere. Now you can only live where we tell you to. So, you know what? We're going to put you on the farthest mining colony planet from existence, 
away from everybody else, and we're going to put you in this, like, simulation techno-dome, whatever, and you're going to just live out your life there, and you're going to keep your dang mouth shut. And I like this idea. I do like this idea. I think it's really cool. It's like, hey, it's really smart. They they both are like, hey, we're keeping our end of the deal, but at the same time, we're screwing you two. That's a very willing and tiny move. I really, really do like this. And so he's fed up. He's just getting sick to death of this. He's like, he's like, I've been living here for 35 years. I'm the most hated man in the universe. And I'm just so freaking mad because I cannot do anything to uh, Wayne Lutani. And as far as I know, Ripley's dead. Like, I, I haven't heard of her. I haven't seen her. I don't know. He's just, he is fed up with this bull crap. So he decides, hey, I'm going to reach out to an old contact that I've met. It's a uh, cyborg, or not a cyborg, a synthetic, sorry. Uh, he reaches out to a synthetic named Cygnus. And Cygnus brings him something that he has been asking for. And Cygnus is just like, uh, oh, we need to go do this in private. They got cameras all over this planet, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Burke's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, let's let's go. I know a place we can go where there's no cameras, etc., etc. And so they go there, and Cygnus, he opens up the this metallic pod, and what do you know? It's an alien egg. And Carter Burke's like, well, I'm back in business. And it's just like, what? Now, I do just gotta say, this is part of a, uh, it's either a four-issue mini or a six-issue mini. I want to say it's of six issues. But that seems like a lot of issues for just devoted to Carter Burke. But, yeah. So, like I said, I really liked the first half of this comic. I liked how they were playing with, like, oh, we're gonna connect aliens with Alien 3. I liked how they, uh, showed how devious and conniving Wailing Yutani is. I think that all that is really, really cool. But then we get to this part where it's like, oh, hey, uh, Carter Burke, he's going to screw over Wailing Yutani. You know what? He's going to do a, use an alien egg to do it and everything. I'm just like, uh, like, look, look, I get it. Paul Reiser and Leon Reiser, you know, they're definitely beholden to Carter Burke. That is Paul Reiser's character. I totally understand that. So they don't, they, w- they want to make it all about him, and I, I get that, I do, because it is literally called What If Carter Burke Lived. At the same time, it's also like, I don't think there's enough here to justify a six-issue series, or even a four-issue series. To me, this is like, this should be a, like a one-shot, but, I don't know, I mean, I will say, I'm going to keep giving it a chance, I'm going to keep reading it, obviously. Uh, I do think that they had some pretty cool ideas, I really like how uh, they tied in Alien 3. So, there's some really cool ideas in here, but overall, I just, I'm not really interested in like, a, oh, hey, Carter Burke's gonna work his way back to the top, and like, like, like I said, that's just that's just me. Yeah, it is what it is. Like I said, this is just a what if story, so it's not gonna be part of my head canon or nothing like that. But overall, I mean, the story, like I said, the story was engaging for the most part. I got really excited by the connections. I got really excited by certain aspects of it, but overall. Do I recommend this? Eh, your your mileage may vary. I will say the artwork, I wouldn't say it was great, but I'm not going to say it was bad either. There were some really good panels where you could see, like, oh, that's clearly Carter Burke. That's Paul Reiser's character, obviously, right there. But then there's others where it's like, that kind of looks like Ripley, but it also kind of looks like a man dressed as Ripley. <laughs> and so I know that's a little messed up of me to say, but I don't know. Some panels were good. Some panels were eh. It was fine. It was serviceable art. So if I had to give this a rating, I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10. I thought this was decent, you know. There's some really cool ideas in here, but it's not a must-read. Uh, if you wanted to know more about the Burt character, I guess this could be the book for you. And I looked it up while editing. This book is a five-issue mini. So five issues. I still think that's way too long. To me, this should n- If you are going to make this any longer than a one-shot, then only two issues. This no, you can't do this for four or five or six issues. No, this just this no. There's not enough story here, in my opinion. But I don't know. They they want to tell a story about Carter Burke getting back on top and screwing over Wayland Yutani somehow. So whatever, it's an Elseworld. You know, you will have fun or you won't. It's it's one of those stories. But yeah. So I like I said seven out of ten. That's my rating. I hope you guys enjoyed this review, and I will talk to you all later.
And for this final book, the big one, I'm here with my man Jason. What up, Jason? Hey, Jim, I'm just confused. Which which podcast is this for? Is this for the Marvel podcast, or are we on Manga Mondays? Maybe. Well, and you say that, and you're joining me and also on the X-Men show. So we we have it all, but really by the end of this, I I would say it fits on the manga. (laughs) I think it fits on the manga feed way more than anything else, and that's it's weird. I don't mind it because I'm a manga fan, and so are you. Yeah, Yeah, you're you're a big manga and a big anime fan, way more anime fan than I am. And that kind of has that feel as well. It's got colors. That's why it's like an anime. It does. Yes, (laughs) indeed. Oh, my goodness. It's fancy. Uh, But when we get into this, I think that the review, the actual issue goes very quick. It's even a little oversized, but I think it goes very quick. But really, there are questions that are raised that aren't just the questions in the book, the questions of. Whether this fits, is it going to win some people over? And we'll try to figure that out as we go, obviously. We'll be more concerned with us. It's going to be a – people are going to have strong reactions to this. Some people are going to be pleasantly surprised and some people are going to be really annoyed. And I I wonder which people will be louder on the internet. I wonder which ones. Yeah, exactly. You say this right before (laughs) we recorded this. I did an initial reactions thing and – Exactly. Word for word. One of the things I said was this book is going to be one that some people are going to really like it. Other people are going to say that it's the worst thing they ever read in their entire life. It, it is. It's weird. And it just I don't I, I, I'm happy that they're trying something. And I do like Peach yeah, Momoko I, myself. I it appreciate seems like a it gem. when comic book big two comic book companies, they, they take a big swing. They make a choice that's different. It's not the same as every other book on the shelf on the rack. So, you know. I got to encourage them to to try to do something different. Two things. I mean, the ultimate, that's a good place to try something. It's the ultimate universe. If people don't want to deal with it, they don't have to. They're not going to be missing out on anything that's going to change current continuity or anything. But a lot of the people who I see yelling and screaming, they'll also be the ones that tell me, not manga because they're not into it. It kind of seems Mm -hmm. to be, you know, that's but indie books. Oh, I like indie because they do different things. They try different things. So maybe give it a shot. I think that. You know, not only that it, it appears mm-hmm, it is a manga kind of, but it's also dealing with a little schoolgirl. I mean, it has all the tropes that I think the people are against. And it really feels like at points they're like, we're really going to make you work. And it's like got this. some dark and serious topics. Like it's it's pretty heavy. It's got it's dealing with it's about a like a 15 year old, I think, because she's graduating middle school. But it is really if this were a manga, it would probably be like a seinen manga. Yeah. You know, this and, would not yeah, be a exactly. shonen jump kind of. Gung Ho put this next to Luffy and One Piece. It's different. Nope. And if people aren't aware, it's like this would, it's a supernatural horror type deal. And it's very, it, it, it's probably the most mature book that I've read in a while at Marvel because of the, the, you know, things they're dealing with. But then yes. it also looks like it's like a little girl manga. <laughs> it's so crazy. Which is, I, I mean, that's pretty common in manga where you deal with uh, like, uh, what's the one called about the little uh, penguin, Poon Poon? That is the darkest, the darkest, darkest concepts, and it's a little cartoon penguin. That's really how a lot of these books are written. It is crazy. It is Ultimate X Men number one. See, I knew, I knew this already. was going to be. You know, it's so weird to talk about. Uh, written and art by Peach Momoko, script adaptation by yes. Zach Davison. So uh, maybe and that doesn't say translation, just adaptation. So no, I, think I there looked is him some up. and whatnot. Yeah. yeah, what does he, he do? He is an American, American born, who's lived in Japan for like twenty years. He does translations of manga into English, and he's also worked with Peach Momoko on her Demon Days, and also he worked with Senshiro Kasama on that Sakura Spider story. In Edge of Spider Verse, so he likes to. I guess he works with manga Japanese typewriters and artists, helping them maybe get their words in the way. He's usually a word guy, not an art guy. So that's what I think. Words so right yeah, for American markets. And I think that why, where they're saying script adaptation too, I think that it might be one of those things that you know, Peach Momoko's like, well, would they understand this? Is this too jab? Maybe it's that too, like not just straight translation, but saying like. Ooh, some, you know, U.S. or other outside, jet, they won't understand that. You kind of got to change, maybe. But it, yeah, it's good that they but have they could that. Ta- He's someone that she could talk to in yeah, Japanese and in get the real get their- idea across exactly. in the full texture. And he could help her maybe get that across for, you know, us dummies here. And, and if people don't know, me and Jason do a Death Note podcast, uh, mostly each and every week. But we end up doing a read-through of Death Note. And it's something that comes up a lot while we're even reading that. And it comes up with other things as well of 
I think there's a translation issue there. I think this the cultural wise it didn't go. There is a lot of police work over there. Police is different here and there. You know, just just things that are different that you don't necessarily know about if you live in one place and not the other. So I think that's pretty cool, even though this completely takes place in Japan. So it's not, you know, but I think that it is adapted towards with the script and it's good to be something right from the source with the Japanese. But we jump into this and you do go to Kiragaya Minami Middle School and you find out that the main character, Seiko, who will and people would recognize this armor. Her coming in, it's near graduation. Yep, same and she name hasn't been, as yeah. the regular armor character yep. in X-Men. Yeah, yep. So people should recognize that. And remember, it's it's a different ultimate universe. So things are different. People are different. And things are set up different in a world, in a world where there aren't, a lot, there aren't, yeah, there aren't superheroes. And people didn't get that concept. You have to keep that in mind as you're going through this, that we're kind of maybe seeing the first jump. Right. Of- it's a very low superpower universe. They're just, it all, it's all been suppressed by the maker, and he's been sealed away. So the things that he tried to keep a lid on are just starting to make themselves known. So we know how Peter Parker gets his powers because he got the spider that was hidden away. We don't know at all how the X-Men... And this book is called X Men, not Armor or Hisako. We don't know how the X Men are going to appear. We have here. no idea. And we is all, there going we, to be we, a school? Is there going to be a team? Yeah. And all we've genetics? seen is Storm, but not as an X Men. Storm is hanging out with Killmonger in the Black of the Black Panther. That's right. Deal. So you know, you sit there and wonder what's going on. And some people freaked out about that, and a lot of people did end up seeing that. And then I'll tell you. If you're, if, it's so weird to talk because I, I think that I feel like I'm trying to convince people who wouldn't be into this. But if you're looking for a grand X Men book, like you said, a school, you know, big muck, there's right. not, if, it's not this. If, if it's you not. miss Chris Claremont, right? I know a lot of people really loved Ultimate Spider Man because it's giving them what they want Amazing Spider Man to be, kind of what Amazing Spider Man used to be in a way. This is not that. This is a very, very different take on the X Men. I mean, it's, it's barely a take on the X Men at all. If you, if you scratched out the name X-Men on the cover, and maybe you wouldn't even notice that the name is the same as Armor, and there's some concepts that are kind of like that, this would be very much at home as a first chapter in Manga Plus. Manga. And usually in manga, they center the first chapter couple on character work. That's kind of what you and, get and here. the concept. Yeah. And the concept. Yeah, you, you start to develop the story, but they really want to nail down the character. And I say this all the time. If you love the character, you'll stick with the character through the thick and the thin if you just get intrigued by a concept or a story and that kind of falls and goes south you're kind of out so i don't mind that but it's different it's a little different and this is a really it's not a big feeling book like the first two the you know black panther and True. spider-man they felt it's, big it's small intimate private it's really all about this one little girl and the thing she's going through and certainly this it could expand out and we could add more characters and it could grow, but for right now in this chapter, it's it's one kid at school going through some stuff. And I'll I'll apologize to people too, and just to prove the idea, this is so much like a manga. Whether people will argue with me and Jason that me and him have both called it a chapter and not an issue, or something that's, <laughs> that's and true. And at one point, Jason even said that he actually almost got fooled to read backwards. I, because I, there's a couple it feels pages, like that. yeah. There's a couple pages that has a lot of Japanese characters in the art. And my brain just automatically started trying to read it panel-wise, left to right. And I just went, wait, that doesn't make any sense. And I had to catch myself because it reads like a manga. And it's crazy. That's one of the big hurdles for manga when you go into it. But if you are reading just regular comics, all you read and the manga, you do get in your brain that those don't cross over like that. You you just get in tune where you open the manga, boom, you know, right to left, back to forth. Uh, But this is, uh, it's different. It really is. And I, I just hope people don't just, hate it just to hate it but it is very small uh yeah. but you get don't, this girl don't hate it for <laughs> not being the thing it's not trying to yeah, be yeah it, it, you know? and i i said in this initial reaction deal and said to people my my concept is if you don't like it that's fine if it's not for you because a lot of things aren't for me or you you know not everything's bass, for everybody right but that doesn't mean it's yeah really bass hygiene <laughs> in general you end up where <laughs> exercise you end up where it, it, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just not for you. You know what I mean? And and so you're going to hear, I like this. I don't love it. I wanted to love it. I don't love it because I still have to remember it's an X-Men book. And so going, but I, I think it's pretty cool. But you start out where 
bunch of girls come over to the Seiko, and we, we kind of find out, and I do think that this is one of those things that reading it a second time did kind of put in, because you're going to get some things just kind of thrown in there that not are confusing, but the idea that she hasn't been in school for a while, we don't really know why. Then we kind of find out it's it's a dark thing, and then it twists and turns. Yeah, she's the, kind of an outcast, and these girls are almost like daring each other to even talk to her, because it's almost like a, a cootie situation, and oh, you talk to the weird girl. It's got that uncomfortable feeling. I don't like them. Uh, but they seem nice, and that's what gets. And even it's a weird thing because they come running over. Oh my God, a Seiko, a Seiko! You hear? Here's a second button. Yeah, this cute boy. He wanted to like. Oh, where is he? And then I'm thinking, was there ever a boy? Because the girl looks confused. But then in the meantime, they're punking her, or being at least kind of mean. But it was mm. the hey, you take the button over. Like somebody gave them a hey, can you give this to the Seiko? And nobody wanted to do it. Like Which I guess is like a, a it explains at the end it's like a token of love or affection that it's the button that'd be over your heart. So if you give that button to a girl, you take it off your uniform, you know, there's symbolism there. It makes sense. Yeah, so it's somebody who almost is like confessing their love, but it it it's this telling thing that these girls who are at the school and say, you know, let's say go say go now, you're not gonna know everybody at the school, but they don't seem to know who he was. They just say this boy. And this ends up having a note, uh, kind of a weird deal. And it says, meet me at the temple. In the meantime, you see a shadowy figure behind her as well. And that's kind of a premonition of what's going to be coming. Because this gets dark and it gets supernatural-esque and a little scary. Might scare the pants off you. But when you're going through this, did you have... And I'll tell you right now, when I'm going, I'm trying to get an X-Men feel of it. I'm telling you, I'm like... Is that the Shadow King? Because he does some wacky things. But that, it's I weird, have it in right? my notes as well. I, I do think that if it's anything, at first I thought it almost it's a little bit like a Venom type thing. It has that dark and covered in goo or covered in something weird. But I do think it is more like a Shadow King situation. Like a Shadow King type of deal. That it, and But it's weird because this is something that is there. I don't know by the end. Now, again, we're going to have themes coming up. But this is what seems to be making things go forward, that it might not be as bad as we th- – it's weird. It's very odd, way, yeah. that it, idea, right? A lot of right? mysteries in this first issue. Uh, I did say issue. I got it right that time. And, yeah, not a lot of explanations, which I'm okay with. I mean, it's only issue one. I don't need it all laid out for me yet. But there is so many ways it could go that it could link up with ideas and topics that kind of attach to the X-Men. Or it could go off in its own whole I'm new I'm glad that life. you thought of Shadow King as well, because that, that was right away. I'm like, it seems like a, a kind of maybe a connect. It's so weird trying to get some connections. But she rides her bike off to the temple to wait for who this boy was. It's also was. a really big thing in the note. It says, you know, I, he calls her my friend. Or I think the Japanese word here is daoshi. At least that's what Google Translate tells me. And it's like comrade or companion. And we can tell this is a girl who doesn't have a lot of friends. No, and I so think note, that's the play. Yeah. So a note saying, "Oh, I'll be. I'm your friend. You're my friend." That really gets her attention, and I think that's almost. If you're thinking Shadow King, manipulative, psychological, that would be the way to get at this character. Yeah, and when you say that, it ex- like she's heading off, and even by her facial expressions, it doesn't seem like she's heading off to. Oh my goodness, a boy. Oh, my heart's a flutter. It's like, who the heck could this be? Right. And a little goes scared, off, like, but a she doesn't want to yeah. miss the opportunity. But she's like expecting to find out that it was the girls playing a trick on her. But she can't not at least try because the idea that someone wants to be her friend is just irresistible. And because it's a note, you can't do like my play back in the day. If you like set up a blind date or something, you, you say, oh, I'll be the one in the red car. I have a blue car. I don't have a red, because I want to scope Sneaky. out the situation first. <laughs> and then if it's bad, I go. And if not, I'm a, oh, I, I, that's my other car. I'm a Rockefeller. Yeah, and then never a red car. So it doesn't work out at the end. So she's there kind of hiding, looking. And then she sees somebody and kind of double takes. And it seems like we find out in a bit this is her friend. It is actually a friend. Yeah, first He's she not sees around anymore. like this little stuff at the bottom of a tree. And we'll see that again later. And then at the same spot, it's this boy, Tsubasa, who was a friend, we find out. And they don't say exactly what happened to him, but bad stuff happened to him. And that kind of seems to be what precipitated her 
not going to school anymore. Yeah, to you know, again, I'll just point out it's this way. We're not going to go for it's the word you're not allowed to say on YouTube when somebody does something to themselves. It's basically the deal, and he's kind of ghost boy here. She double takes, and in that, it's that idea of who's to blame, what happened. There's bullying that went involved, but then we get this shadowy figure. We get this kind of real like ghost. You yeah, know, it's of, it's a shadow, a silhouette, but with like curly little fur all around it's a very creepy look yeah it is again very stylized very much in it and yeah, at there's this a certain point, way that japanese artists and anime and manga tend to make like monster demon character that's just uncanny and like a different angle than like north american artists tend to and i can't put my finger on it but this though stands out as that kind of just, just not right. Just uncanny, not a. You this call world. it uncanny, so it works. Well, I, I right? guess it does. I <laughs> it guess works. so. And I'll, I'll give you one thing too. Going, but again, me and you are so used to this stuff. But I don't think it's that crazy. Like it's not so crazy. The art, but at this point, you're getting bigger panels. Yeah. But nothing is that crazy. But it's neat. It looks neat at points. I even looked at it like. A Juan Ferreira style art is like almost around this kind of deal with the stylized things, but it's not that off the rails. Yeah, I think, a little for some bit people. there. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the closest Marvel type artist. That's kind of what it, it kind of. Now it's it not exact, have a crazy fight. There's no crazy fight scenes in this. There's no wacky angles and panels. No all borders askew. or like no. that. It's it's so it's actually pretty you know set there. It's it's kind of like just what it is, but. Here's where my score goes down a little bit. I will tell you, and I said, it's not, it's crazy for me to say that I had trouble reading white script on black <laughs> background. I was thinking of you when I read that quote. It's, it's not quite as bad as the Batman who laughs. No, it's but. not red on black, but it's the scribbly type deal and it's a little bit small. I, I think it could have been mm. a little bit better. It's going for, you know, the supernatural look. But yeah, it threw me off a bit. There were at least three times where I did have to actually yeah, so magnify yeah, when to get this it. this demonic figure does speak, it's it's dark, because solid black speech bubbles with little bits of like curly things coming off the speech bubbles too, matching up, matching up with its, what it looks like. And then like a handwriting sort of kind of twisty, turny font for him speaking. It drives me to like there's been issues where old Alfred will be writing a journal in, in the Batman deal. <laughs> It'll drive me nuts. It just goes, but. You end up where, again, this thing is there, and I'll give Haseko, she's pretty tough. I mean, she's pretty sassy. Right away, if it's me, I'm running, and I'm soiling myself. She is a middle school graduate, at least, and she's pretty tough. She's like, who are you? Like, she's mad. And she seemed to have already seen Tsubasa, and this guy brings it up. Oh, you remember Tsubasa? Oh, yeah, you know, I'm sure... That would please him when, you know, she ends up giving, she gets this deal, she gets a gift, and they talk about Sebastian, and you're remembering the good old days mm-hmm. of them. But she, he, this thing does give her the armor charm. I mean, and you yeah, see that. This so it's amulet, like, it returns an amulet to her that we find out in a flashback was given to her by Tsubasa. Although, if you read the two page kind of preview that was at the end of Ultimate Universe number one, and that little two pages, it seems like, this charm came from somewhere else. Like she had a dream that she pulled it out of her own forehead. And then when she wakes up at her desk, the girl next to her, who looks like Storm, she picks up this same charm and says, oh, you dropped Yeah, May this. Storm. Yeah, and maybe because we have that, com- like May Storm is going to be in the next issue and then go to school with this. So maybe we get a weird deal. But yeah, you, it looks like, you know, he gives that to her and they're friends. We find out again that he was bullied. At a point, he was upset. Bullied and bullied by his teacher, coach, not even just by, by students. That actually shocked me by the end as well. Yeah. And you had a thing where, you know, he wanted to run away. It's a weird idea of what you tell somebody is being bullied. Like, you, you do have parents who say, oh, bullies just want the attention, so you annoy him. And then in the sitcom, you have the dad, no, I'm going to teach him right. the box. Punch him like, right you in the know, nose, that yeah. whole deal. Yeah. So, the, whichever way, but. She says you can't just back off. You can't just run away. And this is in a, and I'll point it out. You want to go pull out manga. We have black borders for a flashback as well. This is meant to be very much a manga, but in the, you know, X-Men Ultimate Universe. Only on the one page, though. There is some part of the flashback that doesn't have the black background. 
but and yeah, I that think that when do. you get that, you have that big play of like an actual scene. It's it's weird, but you have that, and uh, yeah, and she and it's very stylized where she kind of it seems like when they're thinking about it, left them to the wolves, and this is what led him to, you know, end it. So. It's that play of, you know, who takes responsibility for this. And this is what really upsets her. She wasn't that scared to see this ghost. And sometimes in these Japanese things in a manga, the ghosts aren't necessarily always just bad. They're just go. But this seems like it's, yeah, you know, it's, once it starts mentioning this, it's, it's we trying can't to really trigger. tell if this black creature is Tsubasa, is pretending to be Tsubasa. It's trying to recruit Hisako to join it for something. We don't know what. So we don't know what it's after, except it, it thinks Hisako is important and wants her to join in. In a way, we don't. I don't think she should, Jim. I'm just saying, maybe, maybe she shouldn't team up with this guy. No, I wouldn't. And then when, sus. it does end up twisting, and again by the end, it it like has that play of like I quit running from my problem. My eyes are open. The time for sorrow is over. Now is the time for vengeance. And then it's like, oh, Sabasa, <laughs> what happened? And it really feels like that. But you, it, there's that question. Because it could mm-hmm. be a manipulation thing. And, and again, it could be the idea of a Seiko, like, I needed you to help me. You didn't now do it. It might be that twisty, turny thing. And then we just, I mean, we get some crazy looking, you know, things. We see Tsubasa, you know, kind of in, in the bad place there. Uh, but also she ends up picking up some paper because all this stuff just starts happening. And she's like, yeah, oh, what's when, this? Picks when up the paper. black creature disappears, you see this. It's almost like Blair Witch Project. You see this kind of crude person made of straw. And around it are these paper charms, which are a common thing in, in manga and I guess in Japanese culture that magical spells and lucky charms are often, uh, not the cereal, uh, written on paper and the, the way the calligraphy works. So, it is yeah. almost St. Patrick's Day, so we could go with that. Magically right delicious. Right Jim. away, I was, I was going to give you an Irish accent. I'm glad I did. But yeah, once she sees this vision of her buddy, and you know he's off, that he she runs off. Oh my God, runs off! Now you don't actually see, but it does seem at this point where you know there might be a problem in a bit. Where well, first off, there's a problem, but she also loses something that ends up being a big thing because she's she's running and just flying away i mean she's on her bike just going away and gets hit by a car yeah well she op- she almost gets turned into an isekai story yeah, because I she, know, you know, I know. get run over by truck coon and there you're another world but no no in this case she nearly sends the driver to an isekai oh world my because God. as yeah. the the, uh, the car is hitting her this energy field just erupts around her and whether it's tied to the amulet or whether it seems it's inherent like it would be, in her, or it's inherent, or that's hard the thing. to say. But it's it looks a little bit like a samurai, a little bit like Big Hero Six, and then a little bit like armor from the X Men. It's all those kind of things mixed together. So it looks like a Japanese version of armor in the steel, but it comes in, you know, in the, this being an X Men deal, you, you would figure that. That maybe that charm has act- it's so weird like the combo we don't know but still there lots it is. of questions and also this armor it isn't just a, a force field around her it seems to be a sentient yeah it has being. its own ideas it's not something that she has to then move and it moves with her yeah, it's, it's almost doing like its an iron thing. giant kind of thing if you've seen that movie it has that kind of you know big powerful but also cares for this this person it has that feel to it and this looks really good. It really gets, I mean, having an emotional response from this weird energy creature is is hard to do, and Peach Momoka pulls it off very well. And I, I love to say this poor guy in his car, but I don't like his look. He looks weird. So, you know, weird people should have. <laughs> it's funny, though, when I said earlier, what happens, he, though? He has a really bad case of the manga sweats. Look we talk about the guy. manga sweats Holy a lot. Moly. Yeah. He's, he's had some problems. So he ends up hitting and really gets crushed. Doesn't even actually, he gets hit. His car is destroyed. He ends up in the hospital. She's unharmed. But one of the things that does happen, her diploma, and you don't notice, these are the things, again, when you go through it, it makes more sense even the second time where her diploma goes flying off. Right. And that's going to be a big play where they are looking to see this guy. At least he lived long enough to say, there was a girl. I almost hit her and then went in a coma or something. But they're looking for a girl. Not that it's a weird thing. Like, he when if you would show up at this car this car is in the middle of the road destroyed nothing around it like what did it hit and they they're they're confused and this guy i thought i'd hit a girl like in this she's 
probably freaking out like that. How could I explain what happened or if they find out or whatnot? Because you usually will have in these books already the idea of like, no mutants allowed. Or, you know, you're expecting something, but you have nothing of the outside world, really, of what is going on. No, and what it could affect does. It, so. It does call back to the, some of the basic concepts of X-Men in that it's an adolescent person who is dealing with something weird happening to them that's kind of tied, you know, so, so there's supernatural things that they can happen with them that's tied to their psychological distress. Exactly. Emotional the distress. distress activates things. So you get that, but you're wondering how it actually all fits in. So now she feels even guiltier because now she feels guilty about sending this poor son of a gun to the hospital. She didn't mean to do anything. She was just fleeing in terror from a demon. So you can't really blame her. Look at this car. Yeah, she's fleeing from a demon that might be her her you know buddy. Yeah, it looks like it hit one of those like ran at full speed into one of those uh, steel bollards that are exactly you know, yeah in the ground. So when you say about this armor. That when it, it like it makes sure she's okay. I mean, it's very gentle, and then waves to her. It's like, hey, what up? And she freaks out, <laughs> like, oh my god! And then looks and sees the car. You see, just even the smoke coming off seems like it gets like a su- everything seems supernatural and dark. And then I like this where you go off, and then the next day there is a news report on this. Hey, there was a little girl. We're trying to find her, and you have the mom and the grandma. I'm like, hey, Seiko, are you coming down? And she's Still, like she's there all mm-hmm. night, like staring at that amulet underneath her cut. It's very cool. Yeah. And we get the feeling that mom and grandma aren't that big a part of her life, at least as far as we can tell in one issue that, yeah, they're there. But like she they don't has know her, the inner yeah. workings like exactly. they might. What she's going through. Like at some point tell. you'd even know, like she, they would say, oh, we heard some boy at your school ran into some trouble or something, not even knowing it's her best friend and what they have to happen. But she storms out. Actually, she looks so mad. And she yeah, ends up, but she says it's again, all her part fault. of her character, like where she's going through this difficult thing and, and she didn't want to go to school. So her own problems kept her from going to school, but she's not so discouraged that like she's missing her diploma. And I, I guess I hadn't realized this, but that must be what she's going back for. Is yeah, that she's, why going she's going back, back for the, the diploma temple? because I think when it says they're looking for things, that will tie her to the deal. Oh. If it's just laying on the ground, somebody picks it up and they're going to be like, oh, well, she might have been around. Let's get a hold of her. So I think she's That's like, oh, God, evidence. Evidence, yes. evidence. We got to go. And I love where <laughs> they go. And one of the things, one of the tropes I love so much in any manga are the Gossip Girls. We already had what almost was, but these two, where she pulls around the corner on a bike, Driver was drunk. That's what I heard. <laughs> Definitely drugs, the other one's saying. I'm like, oh, man. Exposition, gotta have it. Yeah, and, and, and with that, that if she can get that diploma, maybe people will go with that. Right? So she's trying to find it, but that's where we see that, you know, it, it kind of got grabbed up by the ghost. The ghost has it. He says, oh, you know, Hey, guilty conscience to say, oh, hey, were you looking for this? You dropped your diploma last night. Wouldn't want to leave behind evidence. And it's like just like waving in front of her face and saying, like, come on here. You know, this will be easier if you join me. And so you don't know. She does does not trust it right away. She's not at all tempted. She's not saying, oh, well, okay, maybe she's like, no, 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 I'm not buying it. That's this isn't even about Tsubasa. You're just using that to try to get to me. What are you really after? So she is she is a very skeptical young lady. Yeah, and says that, you know, hey, I just wanted to. And then start, starts to try to, you know, hey, I just was trying to make you work through your trauma. Hey, you play, you know, the victim and all this. And then says, no longer, I'll tear you out of your, you know, your little shell, you traitor, your smug little shell. And then does go to attack. But as as it goes to attack, ar- that armor comes and looks great again. I mean, looks really cool. And this is where... I really like the play here to really nail down that she's not doing this because she looks up and like, oh, my God. And then it's almost like you said, a Venom-esque attack, but she's covering her ears. She's holding her eyes shut. And this armor is just going at this demon, this this thing, and seems to just squish it out. Yeah, it seems to almost draw its essence out. of this weird, twisty, web venomy goo kind of stuff comes out of the creature's mouth in a really creepy way. And... And that the armored creature just grabs it and squeezes it, and you can see it's it's squeezing this thing. Its eyes are popping out like one of those creepy kids' toys. And, and says, yeah, you know, weird. here's and says, here's a little secret. My curse is already in motion, and the first victim is someone you know. And so now it 
the full out evil, all that sort of thing. But it, it is intriguing. And th- this is sad. This is actually like feels that I didn't expect here, where she then just yells, shut up, and throws the charm. Like all of a sudden, the armor disappears around her. She throws the charm, it goes, and then it goes right to what it looks like Ghost Boy Tsubasa. Tsubasa. And he picks it up, and it's just so subtle, but he picks it up, and we know what happened to him, and it would have helped him if he had this and could have done the same thing, and he says, it's too late. Like, like almost like, because she, she throws it in anger, like, shut up and throws it. But the way Subasa, this ghost, to me, is playing it like, oh, you're trying to help me now? Well, it's too late. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm already gone. I think gone. this is, again, where the psychological you know, symbolism comes in, because she's a kid who needs to be protected. She's depressed. She wants to put, you know, like like you'd write about in a song, you want armor around you to protect you. And she's getting literal armor kind of mirroring what she needs psychologically. But then she gets this really weird phone call. And I thought this was a little clunky because she gets a phone call. And who is who is calling her? I don't know. I, I, I'm telling you. Is it, it Tsubasa's I mom? Don't, it seems parents? like it's... Uh... Yeah, like that, or maybe it's her, she said, and he says, the ghost, like, you should answer that, and she seems scared about this, and then I look, because at this one point, you know, you end up having the coach, who was bullying, or might have bullied Tsubasa, he's doing the same thing, he is off himself, and so, where you have it, I, I don't who, know. Who calls a 15-year-old and says, hey, you, you're friends with that kid who did that bad thing, right? Well, I'm going to tell you that just right now, you're the first person I'm calling to let you know that that coach is no longer going to be in class tomorrow. The only thing I can say is, even though it is in a it is a white lettering on a black background, though it seems more of narration than it might be that, that ghost that we think might have died. and it's It doesn't have the creepy font that has a standard font. No, it doesn't have the creepy font, font, so I don't know. It's weird. Somebody's calling. But very nonchalant, and especially after the ghost said, the curse is already happening, the first victim will be someone you know. And then somebody's bring, bring, hey, that coach, you'll never believe this. And it's like, oh, God. And it, yeah, and, and the panel that shows uh, presumably the coach's wife finding him is just, that's, that's going to haunt It's so you. dark. And I'm I'm shocked that there isn't a, a note. Like, yeah, and, and they you usually have things written like Written on the inside of the door next to him, there's a lot of, like, scribbled Japanese characters. I. I don't know if we need to forward this to uh, to Gray or somebody to get yeah, a to idea see what the heck's deal going on. Because it looks like a manifesto of some sort, or at least, you know, maybe a confession, but it seems a little scattered and all over. Yeah. But, yeah, and so that, and then you just get, like, a picture of the, the temple deal, and it's like, there's what the hell's going on. Something unimaginable is happening, and it's, it, you know, the Seiko saying, it feels like all of our sins, all the dark secrets we hid away, some cruel power was torn off the lid, let it out. What is that shadow and why do I keep feeling the energy protecting me? What do you want from me? And just as gripping that, that deal and to be continued. And uh, again, not much of an X-Men book. I think that's going to be something that, you know, takes a lot of people out of it, takes a, gets upsetting a lot of them. Some people will bail, but I, it's almost like the idea of Peach Mo is like, listen, I'm going to write this sort of story and some people aren't going to be in it. So mm-hmm. I'll just do it my way and I'll make it so that it doesn't feel important to somebody. <laughs> I don't know. It's so weird because it, it's weird that this got past a bunch of people and nobody said it has to be more X-Men for this. This is a big thing. But maybe they're going, well, the first two were big. We got two out of three. You can kind of. And again, room. we don't know I... where this is going to go. It could lead back into, like, like you said, apparently this uh, May Storm as some sort of a, a appreciation for the other person named Storm in Africa. So uh, we know that there's going to be a book called "Is It Just the Ultimates?" I think that's going to be like the capstone tying things together. So that's not going to come out for a few more months. So it's certainly possible that eventually everything crosses over. I've been talking to some people, too, and uh, my man Matt, you know, our friend Matt, he said uh, that the way he thought of it is like, this will be like six issues to set up some characters, and then it'll go off to a big, I, I don't know, it's so weird. It's it's a weird book. It's a quirky, little weird book in something that people are expecting. Yeah, it's hard and, to imagine, like like an Ultimate Spider-Man, we had that, that picture of uh, Iron Man or Tony Stark kind of popping in and saying, hey, here's what's going on, Peter Parker can't imagine that happening in this story it would feel like a whole different like a different universe really 
Yeah, and even like at the end of both of the first two deals, even Black Panther, where you know T'Chaka ends up dying, and then you have you know T'Challa. I'm gonna make sure that I get in the outside world. Like everything felt like it was opening up, and like oh my god, like you get to this and you're like, all right, this is weird. But I think that it's gonna appeal to some people, and some others won't like it at all. But I liked it. I didn't love it. Like I said, I think my score might even be higher than yours. I think each time I've read it, it's gone up a bit. But what would you give it? I enjoy it. I, again, it doesn't feel at all like an X-Men book or like a Marvel book, but I like that. So I'm okay with that. This feels to me like I just opened up the the Manga Plus app and there's, <laughs> oh, well, maybe, oh, did they cancel Red Hood for this? But, yeah, oh, no, here's please. a new thing to check out. And if this were in that app, I would be bookmarking and saying, yeah, I want to read the next issue. So I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. I'm an 8 out of 10 as well. I started out at a 7, and each time I went, it, it went up a, a half a point. So I've read it now you know, the second time. Boom, I'm at 8. Now, granted, I'm going to tell everybody this, that Jason says that, and one of his favorite things is a manga about a cat, but cats run oh, in a diner. I mean, cat seriously. ramen, good stuff. Check it out. <laughs> and I, I said this in the... In the uh, initial reaction video That if you aren't into manga But you read this and you're like you know what I kind of like this as manga like And you want some suggestions on some things to read Please in the comments If you're listening to this or watching it on YouTube At least or if you want to email in If you're listening on the podcast like we'll, we'll steer you towards some things that we like And they might not all be your favorite thing at, at, in, Of all time But there's things that me and Jason Think are the greatest things of all time and some things that are like this, and then some other things that are not like this, but still like really cool. So yeah, if you are, then were there any particular manga that you were reminded of reading this? Did anything come to mind? I mean, here's the thing: like something so just you know popular, like Jujutsu Kaisen, you could even go into and kind of get. Okay. It's not the same kind of feel, but I think that that would work out. You have like a Phantom Seer. Damn, it got canceled. Or that this sort of thing. Me of uh, the Ichino's family's deadly sins. Yeah, that that uh, yeah it does not, a lot. I think the person in that is also called Tsubasa. That was part of it, but just that psychological weird things going on. There's one called the, the Summer Hikaru Died, which again is this a, a, a friend died and comes back in a supernatural way. So it has a very similar concepts in that case. So it has that. It's a very dark story. It is a dark story in the way that. Teenagers' emotions can be really strong and really dark, and it reflects that quite well. And also super bright and super cartoony in sort of that armor kind of way. So that combination of those things gives the story a depth and texture that I'm really enjoying. Yeah, and uh, I mean, that's kind of the play of, you know, those emotions, but that's kind of the play of when the a lot of times the X-Men, when their powers end up, you know, when the mutant gene kind of you know, puts forward and stuff like that through like a, you know, that whole play of change of your life and stuff. But also, it's funny, I was going to mention at the beginning, I didn't, if you actually want to have, and it's one of the most popular ones anyway, but if you want to, if you want to read what I thought, if you said they're going to make an uh, X-Men manga deal, it would be My Hero Academia is what Absolutely. I think right away is what would be what you would think. But that's an easy one that if you like the manga feel, but want a little more of that school type deal, it's, it's very easy to go to that as well. And there's a lot of really good manga. There's so many out there. Uh, but yeah, yeah, let us know what you think. But that is it for the podcast. I'm going to go off now and tell everybody what we talk about next week. But thanks for joining me, Jason. And I'm going to go to that now. All right. And that is the end of the show. Here is what we'll be talking about. Hopefully. Next week, we'll be trying to get to all of these. We'll start with Avengers Twilight number four. Seems like Avengers Twilight number three just came out. That seems odd. We also have Ultimate Black Panther number two. Looking forward to see how that continues. We also have, as I go through the list, Amazing Spider-Man number 45. That's a book. It is. We'll see how that is. I believe that we will probably have our man Zach doing Alien Black, White, and Blood. But me and Zach will also be doing Black Widow and Hawkeye. Stephanie Phillips on that. I hope that that's as good as the Cap Wolf, which was kind of like a guilty pleasure type of deal. It wasn't, you know, a mind bending book, but I did enjoy that. We also have Ghost Rider Final Vengeance. And then I believe that that would be it. Actually, I do believe that that is it for the deal. So, yeah, a bunch of books that we'll be trying to get to next week. I hope everybody had a good time 
listening to this show. Three books, but we went into, uh, you know, a lot of detail and maybe a little too much detail on some of these. But thanks, everybody, for listening as always. And we will talk to you all later. You are all weirdos. Weird science is the revolution. Weird science is the revolution.